Hello, activist lawyer listeners. So I am joined here today by our producer and podcast editor, Jessica Phillips. Hi, Jessica. Hi. So this month we are doing things a little bit differently to mark International Women's Day, which is on... Monday, the 8th of March. Oh, so lots happening here to mark the occasion. So the theme of International Women's Day this year is choose to challenge and with that in mind we'll be bringing you recordings of interviews with a range of women who have been paving the way for the change after facing their own challenges as well as women who are acting as a voice for others to make change happen. Brilliant so we're not just focusing on lawyers but also campaigners, activists, really the movers and shakers talking about a range of issues from we have mental health, we have women in the media, leadership and the importance of inclusivity and diversity when it comes to getting things done. But these aren't just women's issues. These are issues that everyone should embrace and support. So we hope you join us to celebrate women's voices and our women champions always, obviously, but this month in particular. <laughs> so we're going to kick off with the formidable campaigner, Emma D'Souza, who is going to really give us, it's really, we just have time for a glimpse into her recent activities discussing women in leadership, her role as a campaigner and activist, and the current discussion around the Good Friday Agreement and citizens' rights. We hope you enjoy the episode. Emma, thanks so much for joining us here on Activist Lawyer. Thanks for having me. It's great. So we were just chatting there. You're down in lovely sunny Fermanagh today, joining us um, by phone, which is great. Um, how, how's things in Fermanagh? Uh, I mean, things are um, things are pretty good. Uh, we recently moved out to the countryside, so we have been adapting to country living, uh, which involves lots of wellies and Obviously, we're in lockdown here like everybody else. Yeah. So the most exciting thing to happen recently was the sheep in the field across from our house had escaped. <laughs> and we went out and they were eating on our hedges and we were trying to, you know, sort of chirp them back into their field. And that was pretty much the highlight of our week last week. Lovely. But it sounds lovely and peaceful. And it is I very guess, much so. Yeah. And, and a big change for you from moving from Belfast. So just a quick introduction to, for our listeners, for anybody who's not familiar with Emma. Derry Born Emma is the founder and campaign manager of the We Are Irish 2 campaign, with which I'm quite familiar with. It was successful in bringing forward legislative changes to domestic UK immigration law. Emma is also an author, represented by Robert Caskey, freelance writer for the Irish Times, a public speaker and political commentator. She is currently the Women in Leadership Coordinator at the National Women's Council of Ireland, Vice Chair and Northern Ireland Spokesperson of VotingRights.ie, Board Member of the 5050NI and Member of the Equality Commission, Emma. <laughs> You're involved in so many outlets and I will say it's great to have you here. Um, I used to work in the National Women's Council a few years back, so familiar with that organisation and the fantastic work that they do. So perhaps at the end we'll have a wee um, hear from you about that. But just mm -hmm. the first matter that we will focus on, and we're not going to spend too much time on it, it is an immigration related matter. We have covered it in some of our, our previous podcasts, but what maybe helped to propel you, I suppose, to where you are today, um, I'm sure there are many other factors as well, but you and your husband, Jake, who is from America, took a stand against the Home Office in quite a well-publicised immigration battle, I think is a, a good word to describe it, that lasted around, am I right, five years, I mm -hmm. suppose? Um, so there was much discussion on it and really, uh, you know, I mean, it's changed the course of my work as an immigration law practitioner. And I mean this in a very positive way. A lot of my clients, as a result of the changes brought about by your campaign and your work and your case, um, now avail of more options and better options for family reunification as a result of the change. So for those who aren't aware, briefly in January 2020, the UK government committed to change the rules governing how people of Northern Ireland bring their family members to the UK. And this was part of the power sharing deal that restored Stormont institutions. And while this is welcome, the law really only changed later that year. Um, and Emma, you've described it as a, a significant concession from the Home Office, allowing people who identify as British, Irish or both in Northern Ireland and who meet certain criteria can access a better route to family reunification under EU regulations. Emma, that took some energy, I imagine, to get get there and I'm sure you're relieved. And of course, you were able to avail of the more favourable changes yourself, thankfully. 
How has it been? Yeah. <laughs> it, uh, it's still a bit surreal when you think about the substantial changes that did um, come come from her case. Uh, when you think about the origins, you know, me and Jake were just two people that fell in love and mm-hmm. He wants to, you know, he loved, fell in love with uh, living in Northern Ireland and we decided to set up home here. And when you're, you know, two people from two different parts of the world, that is quite a difficult and complicated question because then you have to deal with immigration matters. So it was a big decision. Mm-hmm. And we certainly didn't expect whenever we were starting out in our lives together that we were going to get involved in a five-year legal battle with a government department. Mm-hmm. Um, so to have come at the end of that journey and actually manage to get substantive changes that did have a positive impact on people's lives really did make the five years of challenges worth every moment um, yeah. because we know it's had a positive impact and we're so delighted to see that happen. Uh-huh. Um, but yeah, it took a lot of effort um, and it was a concession because, I mean, they fought us very hard through the court, they did. Um, completely unwilling to budge. And then uh, with, a, with a little bit of luck, I think, in combination, not just with the litigation, but with also the political campaign that we also launched. I mm-hmm. think they finally conceded. Yeah. And I can see it firsthand of people who are just the relief that they felt and they almost couldn't believe that this was now an option for them to get their family members, their spouses, their dependent family members here um, without having to go through more restrictive UK immigration rules, which was the way previously. So it really opened a big door here, but it also really opened a wider discussion, Emma. It didn't just stay there, you know, and that was it, done and dusted, the immigration matter closed. Um, It moved on to a larger discussion about other issues. And I think the timing of all of this is is relevant as well. Um, You know, we're in the Brexit, post-Brexit era. But the Good Friday Agreement in Northern Ireland is something that you've been very vocal about. And a lot of people who um, support your cause and have have worked on similar issues. Just for our listeners um, who aren't perhaps familiar, we all talk about the Good Friday Agreement. It's become really prominent in in the media here recently. It was signed in April 1998, allowing people born in Northern Ireland, well, this is one of the provisions that's relevant to Emma's work, to identify as British, Irish or both. It brought about a new power sharing structure for government in Northern Ireland following decades of violence. One of those things that it required was the decommission of paramilitary weapons, the establishment of joint committees between UK and Ireland and Northern Ireland, and created an all-Ireland economy protecting the common travel area. Again, another phrase that we're hearing very much. So, Emma, your campaign really focused uh, attention on this again, and it comes at a time where the need to maybe uphold the provisions of the agreement have never been more important. How do you see uh, the link between your work and your campaigning and, and this discussion now that's really relevant around the Good Friday Agreement? Yeah, I mean, that really is the origin um, of our case as well, is that, you know, back in 2015, I had a very cursory understanding of the Good Friday Agreement. I wasn't someone who was politically active before. Uh-huh. Um, and I understood that, you know, thanks to that, we had the provision to be accepted as Irish or British or both. And I always thought of it as a great privilege uh-huh. that we had those options and our uh, respective identities and nationalities um, accepted by both the Irish and British governments. So I was quite surprised um, in 2015 when we applied uh, for Jake's residence card as a spouse of an Irish and Union national to be told by the Home Office that I was considered British and I had to therefore go through the process of renunciation of British citizenship in order to access my rights as an Irish citizen. So that's really where it started. Yeah. And for me, I, you know, identity in Northern Ireland is incredibly com- complex. It mm-hmm. cuts across national identities and culture and religion and it has you know huge historical um significance there as well so when it came to that decision i just couldn't escape the fact that for me it felt like something was inherently wrong Mm -hmm. was expecting an irish citizen who has this right enshrined under an international peace agreement um that they can be accepted as such and instead they're being told to uh, you know announce themselves as a different citizenship and then renounce that to go through that process. So that's mm-hmm. the center of where our case came from. And then, of course, it opened up a lot of conversations around citizenship and identity in Northern Ireland because the um, the issue that we took here was that the British Nationality Act 1981 is still in place in Northern Ireland. Mm-hmm. It hasn't been amended since the Good Friday Agreement to reflect the fact that Northern Ireland is different from the rest of the United Kingdom in respect to citizenship. 
and identity. Um, and I think a lot of people here would be far more familiar with the Good Friday Agreement than they would be with the British Nationality Act 1981. Mm -hmm. And so when our case came about and it became public, and certainly when it went through the, the court and you know, decisions were coming out that were declaring all the people of Northern Ireland British, whether they identify as Irish or not, it did create shockwaves, I think, across a lot of people here on the island who were surprised to discover that what they thought was a fundamental right and part of the Good Friday Agreement has not been properly implemented mm -hmm. into domestic UK law. So it's the resolve, the resolution of our case in terms of immigration is, is incredible and it's a great relief for us as a family mm -hmm. and for many others, but it opened the door to bigger conversations around yeah. identity and citizenship and those issues in particular remain to be resolved. And the legislation is still in place there. So I guess it's kick-started a uh, debate and I think it's been incredibly, it's gained so much momentum, um, not only here but uh, around the world. Um, and again, this also led you into another very much a linked discussion and issue around voting rights. And as someone who is Irish and lives in Northern Ireland, you also you, you joined you, you came on as vice chair to voting rights dot IE. And I know there's an up there's a, a conference coming up, Northern Voices and the Extension of Voting Rights to Citizens North of the Border. How have you um, I suppose approached this in your work and how important is it to shed a light on this very important issue? Well, it's very important to me because, you know, the right to vote is a fundamental part of citizenship. Um, mm -hmm. And Ireland um, is pretty far behind um, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, our global partners and certainly in terms of our e European neighbours when it comes to how they enfranchise their citizens abroad. Mm -hmm. You know, at the moment, um, Irish citizens abroad and in Northern Ireland don't retain the right to vote after 18 months. Um, during that 18-month period, they can only retain the right to vote if they intend to return. Mm -hmm. um, so it's quite an outdated and um, archaic voting uh, system that they have in place that the majority of people actually support changes to. Yeah. And um, the current government has already committed in the program for government to hold a referendum on extending presidential voting rights. And I think this is an incredible opportunity to recognize the importance and also the um, the commitments and contributions of Irish citizens abroad. You know, going abroad is almost like a rite of passage for a lot yeah. of Irish citizens. Um, many do return home. And also, of mm -hmm. course, for generations, many Irish citizens left Ireland, often through no choice of their own due to yeah. any number mm -hmm. of, of devastating um consequences that there was an Irish society. Mm -hmm. So I think that for me it was an exciting opportunity to have a discussion about Irish citizens who are outside of the state and also to expand on the concept of what an Irish citizen is. Mm -hmm. You know, the mm -hmm. voting system now is very exclusive. It's exclusionary in that it only takes into account really citizens that live within the state. Yeah. And I think that that, you know, for me as someone who has defended Irish citizens' rights, who's reaffirmed um, or rights in Northern Ireland as Irish citizens. It's you know, it's not the it's not the Irish myth that I see. It's not how I see being part of the Irish nation, which is of course mm -hmm. our rights under the constitution. So I think it's really important to have these conversations, and I think it's a really exciting campaign that I'm excited to be a part of. And um, we will be having a um, conference on March first. March the first. Um, yeah. That is going to be exploring um, citizenship and also exploring how the presidential voting rights can affect people in Northern Ireland because, of course, identity here is, is so complicated. Absolutely. And that's uh, going to be a very exciting process, I think. And it's been referred to as the hierarchy of Irishness. And it really, it's it, it, there's so many layers to this, even from a citizenship and nationality perspective in, in terms of who's entitled to Irish citizenship as well, which is another discussion I know that's been brought before the Shannad, um, you know, following on from the 2004 referendum, which changed the notion of um, how, how one acquires Irish citizenship in Ireland. So I, I think it ties in somewhat in terms of um, that that more kind of a uh, large scale conversation around citizenship and again what you're saying here I mean what does it mean to be Irish and you know what benefits does one get from Irish citizenship as well and um, so it's a very very interesting debate and 
again, if listeners can, after this, 1st of March is the conference, Emma. Mm -hmm. That'll be uh, one to watch as well, just to see how that conversation evolves. And you have um, huge support, I think, Emma, on that point from both the senators as well. I mean, it seems to be an all-Ireland conversation, you know, uh, which is great. So um, hopefully that... Uh, is, is something that will evolve and just on identity as well I mean how has I, I mean I feel again the conversation has been opened up about identity and we always had stuck to the concept of green and orange you know it was very much politically charged have we moved on from that and do you think it's necessary to move on you know in a post-Brexit era you know how do you do you feel that notion or concept not just of Irishness but identity as we view it in Northern Ireland perhaps as a whole has been viewed and, and perhaps is changing? Yeah well I mean since the Good Friday Agreement we've seen in Northern Ireland really a growth in those who don't identify as unionist or nationalist mm-hmm. um, and unionist and nationalists are the you know primary two political ideologies that have existed and maintained much of the division in Northern Ireland for since its inception really um, and I think that the Good Friday Agreement provided a Space for people to blur identity lines, and that mm-hmm. was um, hard to do with the fact that the UK and Ireland were both joint members of the EU at the time. Um, unfortunately, we don't have that protection <laughs> now, yeah. but it gave people space to move away from those descriptors. Yeah, and we've seen that there has been a massive growth in people who don't uh, choose to use these labels, and I think that's coming through a lot in young people that are coming up today that are more focused really on having a rights-based society of equals. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, just having a good life and equal opportunity and bigger issues like climate um, than they are in terms of political ideology yes. and these binary labels of unionists and nationalists. Mm-hmm. It's something that I've spoken about um, in great detail. And I think part of the problem is that often um, in terms of those who speak of the people of Northern Ireland from the outside, mm-hmm. refer to the people of Northern Ireland as these two binary designations, sure. unionists and nationalists. And I actually think that it sort of perpetrates this sort of um, segregation within our society. And it neglects and leaves out all those in between. Yeah. You know, these are not just, unionism and nationalism are not just one question. They are actually complex political ideologies. And there are parties that are unionist parties and nationalist parties. Mm-hmm. And they come with them a whole raft of different belief systems. Mm-hmm. Um, so to narrow it down to just the constitutional question is not actually correct. And I think that. We need to see these as, as the political ideologies that they are and recognize that in any society there is a diversity mm-hmm. of political ideologies. So liberals and conservatives and yeah. uh, all, all, all those in between. And Northern Ireland is no exception. We have people yeah. that hold the same political ideologies as they do across the border. Mm-hmm. Um, yet we'll often hear, you know, even from the Irish government, reference and continually referencing nationalists and unionists. Yeah. And I think that what we need to do is move away from these labels and first see each other as citizens and people and accept that there is, of course, broad diversity within this society as there is in all societies. Yeah, and it helps ensure inclusivity in any discussion, any important discussions going forward. Um, one thing that you've been outspoken on as well quite recently has been the Northern Ireland Protocol, something that we're all still trying to grapple with. So for listeners who might not be familiar with this, um, it, the Northern Ireland Protocol really allows Northern Ireland to be treated as though it has remained in the EU single market for trading purposes. And this helps preserve the Good Friday Agreement, which we spoke about, and which also ensured the removal of a physical border infrastructure, which was very important between the North and South of Ireland. The agreement um, enshrined that. Northern Ireland does remain um, in the UK for customs, legal and administrative purposes. And it, it contends that there'll be no hard or a physical border as such between the North and South. But effectively, there has been a border placed in the Irish Sea. I know this is this is all part of the Brexit withdrawal agreement and it's highly contentious at the moment. And I know there's also a four year review clause. Um, Emma, how have you reacted to the, these changes? Because it really does relate back to the preservation of a lot of the um, clauses within the Good Friday Agreement. And, you know, do you think this is something that's going to be part of our lives and a huge discussion? Because it impacts people in so many different ways. 
what has your approach been to this seismic change? Well, I think in the first instance, it's important to, you know, reaffirm the fact that the constitutional status of Northern Ireland hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. And yes, the Northern Ireland Protocol has brought in a, you know, a border than the Irish Sea in terms of trade. Um, And, you know, it's not great. Um, The protocol has its problems. There's certainly a lot of implementation issues around it. Um, But at the same time, this is a consequence of Brexit as a whole. You know, the problem is not the protocol, the problem is Brexit. And I think um, back in 2015, 2016, when the campaigns were happening around Brexit, um, that there wasn't enough consideration placed into how would Brexit affect Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was really an afterthought. Um, And so the fact that we are in this situation now, it's not great. Um, A lot of people are upset about the current, um, current system in place. Um, but also, you know, the people of Northern Ireland didn't even vote for Brexit. Nope. So there's, there's, all, there's a, a bit of an air of everything being a little bit undemocratic at the moment for the people of Northern Ireland. Because in the first instance, uh, the fact that the people of Northern Ireland voted 56% to remain part of the EU yeah. was dismissed really by the um, First Minister and the main Unionist Party, the DUP. The DUP went into um, an agreement with the Conservatives with Theresa May when she was in as Prime Minister and did have the ability to try to sort of wield some political power to negotiate a deal that would work for the people of Northern Ireland and that would respect the Good Friday Agreement and that would, you know, really what we needed was the softest version of Brexit possible. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, the DUP is a pro-Brexit party, and to them, the priority was Brexit at all costs. What was the saying they had? Brexit means Brexit, was I think Theresa May's um, slogan. <laughs> and unfortunately, over the period of four years of negotiations, the fact that the people of Northern Ireland voted Remain um, was just not really put on the table yeah. in any serious way. And outsiders then had to try and influence these conversations. The Irish government took a very active role in trying to find a way to compromise with what was happening in the UK, but also protecting the Good Friday Agreement. And many suggestions were made, and all of them were turned down. And in the end, what we ended up with is a compromise, which is the Northern Ireland Protocol. And it really was um, the only thing left on the table, and it was cut through uh, by the British government. They voted for it. It's in place. It's part of the law. Um, And now we in Northern Ireland just have to find a way to make the situation that we're in now work. Mm -hmm. And do you think, I mean, most of us, I know my age group, have known a relatively peaceful Northern Ireland following the Good Friday Agreement in 1998. Do you think there, I mean, some people are, describing it as agitation now among communities is there a threat to the stability that we've known here or do you think there's a way to you know move things forward and ensure that all parties all communities really get around the table and ensure that that doesn't happen um well i think that what we really do need is political cooperation right now and we're not seeing that we're actually seeing a division within Mm -hmm. the political parties with unionist parties really agitating for the removal of the Northern Ireland Protocol. And I think that creates a lot of instability, not mm-hmm. just within their own communities, but also in terms of business. Yeah. Because businesses need stability right now. And Northern Ireland actually is in quite a good place when it comes to business because it's sort of half in, half out mm-hmm. when it comes to business. So I think that there really needs to be um, a collaborative effort from our politicians and we're yeah. not seeing that. In terms of the fact that, you know, we have seen, you know, some... Um, threatening graffiti, we've seen an increase in, you know, some, uh, you know, insinuations that maybe we could be on the cusp of there being some sort of trouble um, here in Northern Ireland. I mean, I think for me, I, I like to remember and, and always recall the fact that there have always been those in Northern Ireland who have been opposed to the Good Friday Agreement yes. and opposed to progress. And I think that uh, many may see this as an opportunity to try and push through that agenda. You know, we have seen an anti-Good Friday agreement um, rise in terms of from those groups that don't or have ever supported it. And I think they're using the Northern Ireland Protocol as a means to try and continue to undermine the agreement. 
Mm-hmm. I don't think it's possible to do that. I think that the Good Friday Agreement will hold firm and that, you know, it, it belongs to the people and the majority of people here who just want a peaceful existence um, and want to continue to thrive mm-hmm. under the peace process that we have. So yeah. I think that whilst it's unsettling and, you know, it makes us all a bit nervous to see this um, agitation happening, I do think the dust will settle so long as the politicians uh, hold back on their rhetoric a little bit. Good. So, I mean, all of these issues are sensitive. There's no doubt about it. And you address them um, yourself, whether through your various different roles or I think on a, on a personal level as well. And you've made so many connections both within this country and, and further afield. How just, I mean, on a, a personal level, how do you manage the pushback. I mean, some people obviously do not agree with your point and that, that's fine. I mean, a lot of people here, we all have our own views, but just in a part, because you're, you use social media may, as your main platform, I guess, um, you know, to get your, your, your thoughts out there and your opinions and your work out there. How do you manage the pushback from critics or those who have a different opinion and want to voice that? Is it difficult or are you used to it by now? Well, I am well used to it um, <laughs> in terms of from the beginning of our case. I mean, mm. the first time we went to the press, uh, there was a lot of negative um, comments and a lot of negativity uh, thrown at me and Jake, but we've always taken it in our stride and maintained a good sense of humor. Yeah. I actually remember, you know, one of the, the points that was made by a number of people back whenever we first came out was they were making reference to the Meat Love song, I Would Do Anything for Love, but I won't do that. <laughs> And uh, I thought it was quite witty. So yeah. we ended up listening to that song for a week straight <laughs> um, and having a real good laugh at it, you know, because of course they believe that mm. I really should just, you know, have renounced my British citizenship and given in. But of course, yeah. that wasn't something I was willing to do. Um, in terms of pushing back, I think for me, I have always tried to do a positive campaign. Um, and whenever I am faced with um, discourse or with someone who doesn't agree with me, I like to first try and understand their perspective, where mm-hmm. they're coming from, why they think that, why they feel that way. Um, and then I also like to go back to the Good Friday Agreement. Yeah. It's really like my blueprint. That's yeah. what I go to for just going back to the principles of mutual respect, equality, parity of esteem. And I just keep going back to that and also sticking very closely also to the law. Um, because our case was so entrenched in legal processes, I really just like to stick to the facts and you have yeah. a safety within that. And Emma, you've obviously been keeping an eye on what's been going on in, in the US political landscape. Huge changes there. As we know, you had already received quite significant support for your campaign um, from prominent politicians over there. Are you still in contact and you know, do you see um, that support continuing going forward now with the new administration? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I I visited the U.S. just before we entered into this global pandemic last year, and it was incredible um, to have the welcome that I received in Washington, Mm D.C., New York, and Boston as well. I find that, you know, I I went over there, and, um, of course, all these people were already fully briefed on our case, fully briefed on the issues, and, you know, the determination and commitment that they have for the Good Friday Agreement was so clear and mm-hmm. so reaffirming as someone who has been, you know, campaigning for the full implementation of the Good Friday Agreement yeah. to see if that support really is there. I was hosted by the Ad Hoc Committee uh, for the Protection of the Good Friday Agreement, and I had a number of meetings with some quite high-profile uh, congressmen, including uh, Richie Neal, mm-hmm. um, Peter King, uh, Brendan Boyle, and I also met with Hillary Clinton um, in New York, which was pretty incredible and I actually have kept in contact with Hillary Great. since then <laughs> which in itself is amazing it is um, but those connections and contacts I think in many ways they were a catalyst as well for mm-hmm. the concession that we ended up getting because I was in the US during the time of the um, commitment to make changes came out in the program in the Stormont deal mm-hmm. um, and then it took us a couple of months to get that commitment realized into legislation and The U.S. does wield, I think, quite a considerable bit of power when it comes to the U.K., especially since we're seeking a trade deal. Absolutely. So I think that that was a a catalyst, in a way, um, that helped 
pushed through those legislative changes mm -hmm. because once they saw me also in the U.S., they were like, oh, here, we're going to have to do something about this now. <laughs> so <laughs> I think it was part of the deal with that. Um, and the new administration, it's amazing. You know, Joe Biden has a lot of um, Irish uh, blood in him and he is committed to the Good Friday Agreement and we're seeing a great cabinet coming together that are also... Um, a lot of Irish um, heritage there. So mm -hmm. I think that this is a good thing. Um, I think that it will help us here in Northern Ireland in terms of the Northern Ireland protocol and Brexit mm -hmm. and the Good Friday Agreement. We do have some really strong allies, and I know that they're all very committed and that meetings are happening on a very regular basis yeah. with groups like the Ad Hoc Committee and with congressmen between political parties here and civic society. And I'm uh, still in contact with all those people. That's fantastic. It's good. I, I heard, I mean, the briefings are, are regular in terms of what's going on here, which hasn't been happening for, um, you know, some time on a, on a meaningful basis. Mm -hmm. So it's fantastic to see that support up and running again. That brings us nicely to our next point, which is really around women in leadership. And we know that March will see celebrations around International Women's Day, which isn't any longer a one day event, I think, um, but we're taking it as the month. So, <laughs> And we hope to um, have some of our own events coordinated around that. The campaign is the the hashtag choose to challenge, which you, Emma, certainly did <laughs> uh, for many years now. You chose to to challenge, um, you know, your, your own case as well, your immigration case. So and of course, in turn, that impacted the lives of many, many people. And perhaps your current work also inspires others to do the same. Did you face any obstacles as a woman? Do you think that that made a difference in any of the work that you've done or, you know, have lined up? Has it been an issue? I mean, the reality is, is that, you know, even today we are still facing a number of societal and institutional barriers to women in public life. Mm -hmm. You know, it is just it can be quite difficult. Um, and like many other women in the public eye, I have been subject to uh, more scrutiny yeah. than maybe some of my male counterparts. And I think that is part of the reason that draw me, drew me to the National Women's Council and to the area of leadership, um, especially since in terms of politics, Ireland is trailing so far behind in terms of political participation yeah. uh, for women. And I was deeply disappointed, um, you know, in the... Uh, current government not bringing in enough women um, to committees and also to uh, the Senate. And I was very disappointed to see the lack of young women being brought into the North, or actually anyone from the North so far. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I became quite interested um, in, well, what can we do here in terms of trying to increase uh, political participation and also sort of highlighting the leadership of women. Mm -hmm. In terms of myself, um, Often people have asked me, well, am I going to enter into politics? Yeah. And I have, of course, considered um, whether or not that's where I will, will move in my career. But I had thought to myself, what I would really like to do um, is try to break down some of the barriers mm -hmm. to women in political um, participation first. And in my head, I have this dream of eventually deciding, okay, I'm going to run. And I'm going yeah. to take a raft of young women with me and we're all going to run. Yeah. Um, and break down some of those barriers. Um, and I hope that that does one day happen. Mm -hmm. And I think that is uh, part of my inspiration for taking on this new challenge. Um, in 2021, my goals, my priorities uh, within leadership are to increase uh, young women in leadership, mm -hmm. uh, north-south cooperation, because NWCI is, a, is an all-item organization. But I think it's mm -hmm. really important to recognize that the barriers that women face in leadership, um, you know, they're the same north and south. Yeah. They're not... Uh, you know, they're not separate. We're all facing the same challenges. Exactly. Um, and then also, um, I want to try to sort of redefine what we mean by leadership. Mm -hmm. Because often, yes, we think leadership is in politics. But, you know, women lead in so many other ways, in terms of civic society, in terms of communities, in terms of in the arts, and sports, and academia. So I think it's important to try to redefine what we mean by leadership. Yeah, and I mean, there's been lots of coverage recently as well, women in the media which I know has been coming up more and more and uh, equality issues that are arising there. And we hope over the next few weeks to cover um, many of those areas. But that's very exciting, Emma, um, in your new role. No, no better person. 
And just as well, we ask all of our guests. So obviously this podcast, the, the, the fundamental goal is to reclaim, you know, the phrase activist lawyer. But we're not just referring to, to lawyers. Of course, we've um, been lucky to have campaigners and activists on this show. How important for you is it to really fight back and to represent vulnerable people in our community and to really embrace that term of activism, especially these days where there's so much happening. And, you know, I think I'm proud to say that a lot of my colleagues and anybody who's been accused of being a lefty lawyer or a do-gooder, <laughs> they've really owned the term and they've, they've run with it. And it's made them really, you know, kind of highlight the work that they do and the difficulties that they face in their work. So I think all in all, it's been a positive thing, despite it being completely horrendous and inappropriate for a government to address any member of the legal sector like that. But how important is it for you? And, you know, how do we bring younger people along with us um, in terms of getting more active in our communities? Uh, Well, firstly, I love that uh, you've reclaimed um, that uh, (laughs) term, activist lawyer, and uh, it's great to see um, In terms of activism, I often refer to myself as an accidental activist Mm -hmm. um, because I wasn't really active before a case. And really what happened was I encountered uh, an injustice that I couldn't stand for and I took a stand on that issue and then became an activist through that. And I think that through my own campaign work and the work that I've done, um, I hope that it can show individuals that you can um, achieve substantive changes and make a positive impact even as just one person. Yeah. Um, you know, often when you're dealing with the bureaucracy of a department such as the Home Office that has endless resources, um, it can feel very daunting. Mm-hmm. And, you know, part of what they are trying to do is make individuals feel like they don't have the power to challenge the state or challenge the law or make a change. And in truth, uh, individuals don't need necessary to have the same resources, but rather uh, can do so just with determination and will. Mm-hmm. And I'm hoping that our case can be a positive example of how individuals can challenge um, and overcome these difficulties. And it shows the power of activism, you know, at an individual level. Yeah. And I think that that really is essential. It's an essential proponent of a democracy mm-hmm. to have this, because really, if we look through history, you know, much of the changes that we've seen have come from activists. Absolutely. That's fantastic. Well, look, that is us um, wrapping up here. Emma, we've covered so much in such a short space of time. I think we could have had individual episodes in each of those areas, but we hope to have you on again at some stage to check in to see how matters have evolved and wish you all the best in your role, um, Women in Leadership, and we'll obviously be following um, developments there. Uh, so again thank you so much for joining us today thank you so much for having me it was an absolute pleasure and I really enjoyed and uh, we'll enjoy listening to the episode thank you Emma we'll talk to you again talk to you soon take care 